I'm really delighted to welcome Arianna Neumann, um, who's going to be talking about her book, When Time Stopped. If you haven't read it, you should definitely go out and buy it tomorrow. Um, I couldn't put it down. Uh, the characters are so finely drawn and you feel so closely connected to them. But as I was approaching the final pages, I slowed down my reading pace as I just, I couldn't bear to cut my ties with them by finishing the book. It's such a memorable read. And so you're in for a real treat tonight. This evening's uh, talk is the 21st in our Virtually Speaking series, which we started in July this year. And we've reached over 700 households already with topics ranging from Winston Churchill to jazz, global health to cookery, um, and many more. Uh, and if you've missed any of them, you can find them on the Latimer Foundation website and can catch up on any you missed. And you can also see what's coming up next. Can I thank those of you who made a donation when booking tonight very much for your generosity. Um, these, this series of talks has raised almost 10,000 pounds so far, um, all money that goes towards our annual bursaries appeal, which is part of our Inspiring Minds campaign. As many of you will know, our aim is to raise 40 million pounds to fund bursaries for one in four of our students by 2024. And this term, one in five of our year seven students was able to join Latimer on a bursary. And that takes the total number of students who benefit for bursaries in our school up to 230. So a real huge thank you to everyone who's helped us with that. Um, a couple of house rules for tonight's talk. Um, everybody will be on mute so you can all hear the presentation clearly. Please feel free to type questions in the chat facility uh, so Ariana can review them and she'll answer as many as time allows at the end of her talk. So without further ado, I'm delighted to hand over to Ariana. Thank you very much, Amanda. It's, uh, thank you all for being here. I, um, it, it's, it's wonderful to be here. Uh, at, um, I, I love Latimer. I've always said if I could shrink myself, uh, well, not shrink myself, if I could turn back time, I would, um, I would just love to <laughs> go to Latimer. Um, but I think the Inspiring Minds campaign is, is, is obviously brilliant and, and it's, it's a thrill to be here tonight. So I'm going to start um, tonight's presentation with something a little unorthodox, perhaps. Um, I am going, and hold on a second, I'm going to share my screen. And most people hide their baby pictures. And I'm going to do just the opposite. I'm going to actually not only share my baby pictures, I'm actually going to share my baby videos. Uh, and you might think that's a bit weird. You know, I thought I was coming to talk about a book. Um, but this didn't start its life as a book. So here you go, a little bit of a baby video. Um, I grew up in Caracas, Venezuela, which was in the 70s and 80s, a vibrant, luminous place filled with promise and potential. I was that little ugly child with the short hair, and that was my father. I came rather late in his life. Um, he was 50. And he was a very successful industrialist, a bit of a Renaissance man. He um, dabbled in all sorts of things from art to education um, to obviously industry. Um, he wrote articles for newspapers. So he really was a Renaissance man and he had a very exciting life. He was always talking about the present. He was very excited by the potential, by the future, but he never ever spoke about the past. So all I really knew about him as I grew up was that he had been born in Prague in 1921 and that he had emigrated with his brother in 1949 and that he had done so to, at some stage, this was, uh, the phrase was thrown at me, I suppose, he had done so to escape a broken Europe, but that was never explained. And what he had left behind was just never talked about. So when I was a little girl about that age, 
I um, started a detective club. I grew up as an only child. I had half siblings, but they weren't with me. So I gathered my friends and my cousins in this beautiful, vibrant garden that I had. And we set up a little club where we would spy on all the people who weren't very interesting, but who seemed rather interesting at the time. And one of the, we would meet on Saturday afternoons and we would meet in a disused dog house at the end of the garden. And one of those afternoons, my cousin Rodrigo reported that my father had moved a box. And my father was a very organized man. He was, had lots of peculiarities. He collected all sorts of things. He collected art, he collected books, but he also collected watches and he loved his watches. He was obsessed with them actually. He had 297 of them. And when he wasn't, doing something exciting or writing an article, he would be in a special room where he fixed those watches and they were pocket watches, so they weren't quartz watches. And he had to ensure that the mechanism of each one of them worked. So he spent a lot of time in this windowless room to which only he had keys. And my cousin reported that my father had moved a box from that room to the library and he said my father had moved it carefully very carefully as a matter of fact as if it had contained treasure so i waited for everyone to go that saturday afternoon because i figured it involved my father and i wasn't quite sure to share whatever secret whatever treasure i was going to discover with my detective club members and i went and i found that box picked it up very was very much like this, as a matter of fact, <laughs> and I, it was light. There was obviously no treasure. I was pretty disappointed and I opened it up and there were some really boring old papers, but then one of them stuck out and it stuck out because this is my father and I recognized him. Um, that I would recognize his eyes anywhere. So even though he was much older by the time I came around, much more wrinkled, those eyes were unmistakable. And obviously the stamp was disturbing, but there were other things that made no sense. So it was dated 1943 and it said Berlin. And that of course made no sense because my father was from Prague. And what really, really jarred was the fact that the name was not Hans Neumann, but Jan Sebastian. So I ran to my mother and I said, we're living with an imposter. This man is not who he says he is. Um, and I think that really started me, started me on this, on this adventure really. Um, because I always wanted to be a detective and what I hadn't quite realized was that the biggest mystery I would ever solve would be that of my father. Um, the box disappeared, um, but the box brought to the fore all these other clues, some of which had appeared um, before the box. So my father, for example, had nightmares. He would wake up screaming often. Um, he would wake up the whole household and he'd be screaming in Czech or in German or in a language that I didn't understand. But they were frequent, the nightmares, and they didn't marry up with this blissful life that we had in Caracas. Um, and there were other things too. So um, any question about the past was met with a wall of silence. And every so often it wasn't just silence, but he would start to shake. Um, so clearly I just didn't go there. And then in a house filled with photographs, photographs of my mother's family, photographs of, you know, just lovely, happy, smiling friends and family members. There was only one photograph of my grandparents, of my paternal grandparents. And it was by my father's bedside, it was black and white. And it was the most dismal photograph you could think of. It was two men, two, a man and a woman, two people sitting around a table looking miserable. Um, they weren't smiling, they weren't looking at 
the camera. I, I just did, never understood. I still actually don't understand why <laughs> that was the picture he kept of them, but that was all there was. And then as I grew older, other things happened that became more clues. So I went to university in Boston. When I was 17, um, I arrived there and we had something for international students called international orientation. And after one of the initial meetings, this young man, this young boy called Elliot came up to me and said, we should meet. And when I said, why, why should we meet? He said, well, because we're both Latin, we're both Jewish, and we're both good looking. And that was the first time anyone had used the word Jewish in reference to me, certainly to my face. So I turned around and I said, right, well, we've got a problem. Yes, we're Latin American, but I'm not Jewish and you're not good looking. Um, so that was the start of a long, lifelong friendship. Um, but that Jewish thing really stayed with me. And I, I asked Elliot, what do you mean? And he said, well, he said, first of all, you look Jewish. And second, your last name is Jewish. And um, I said, well, I'm, I'm not Jewish. And he said, well, your father obviously has to be. He must have Jewish blood. So I called my father to just let him know how you know college life was going. And I told him that I had met this Mexican boy called Elliot who had come up to me. And then I said, Elliot said, we have Jewish blood. And the line went completely quiet. <laughs> and my father said, you will never ever use that term again, because that is what Hitler said about us. And he put the phone down. Um, so there was another clue. In 1997, I went to Prague, as one does as a tourist, such a beautiful place. and. Um, I went on my own with some friends, actually, not with my father. And there, I don't know if you've been there, but there's a beautiful Jewish cemetery and there's a the Pincus Memorial, which lists all the 77,000 plus names of Jews or people, actually, that were victims of Nazis uh, during World War II. And literally, as you walk in, there's two steps, and I just happened to go up down the two steps and I, if you look straight to your right as you walk in in the first chamber the fifth line down has my father's name so Hannes Stanislav is my father's first name Neumann obviously his last name and that was his date of birth and if you can see all the other names have a date of birth and a date of death my father had a date of birth and a question mark So those were my clues, but I didn't really get a chance to solve the mystery while my father was alive because he wouldn't answer any questions. But when he died in 2001, he left me this box with that ID card and it was actually crammed with papers. It um, included I official papers and also a, about a dozen pages of a retrospective diary of his time in Berlin that he had um, that he had written in 90, 1991 and 1992. So I was having kids, my, I literally had, my father died in se September and I had my first son in October. Um, and I, I wasn't quite ready to delve into the past. I ha had no idea what I was going to find. So I, I left it literally just on a, a cupboard and, and I didn't really think I could delve into this horrific, what I assumed would be a horrific story, and then go upstairs and do the voices of the very hungry caterpillar to my kids. Um, but slowly I became bolder and I started asking questions of the family that were still alive. Um, and I hired a researcher in Prague and all these other uh, boxes, and I traced people, these other boxes started arriving. Um, one of them with the most extraordinary letters um, and it came from my uncle's widow and it contained about 50 letters that had been snuck out of the concentration camp of Theresienstadt where my grandparents 
were interned between 1942 and 1944. And that was a treasure trove. It was a treasure trove because it enabled me to meet these grand grandparents that had never been spoken about, um, that I wouldn't say were really forgotten because they were always there, but they were just bailed in, in a silence. And all of a sudden I had a chance to read these letters that were written by two people in their 40s when my grandmother was mid 40s and my grandfather was in his early 50s. And they were letters written to their sons. Um, and each letter was just crammed with information and details and, and, and just, you know, emotion. And because of course they didn't know if they were ever going to see their, their sons again. Um, so it was wonderful to have this window into my grandparents and to get to know them through their letters. And it was quite unusual to have any letters snuck out of the camp. So my father and his brother who had stayed outside had started a system of contraband. And that meant that the people taking in the extra food and the extra currency and the extra hair dye so that my grandfather could appear young, younger than his years um, would sneak out these letters. So it's very unusual to have those. And, um, and I think as I had those translated and, um, and historians became involved, I started realizing that this was quite an unusual story. Um, and it wasn't just the story of my grandparents, but there were sort of really marvelous stories that I started, that started appearing, that people started telling me. And there were stories of courage and love and defiance and, and of people helping my family. Um, by taking the most extraordinary risks. Um, and I think the most extraordinary story of all, really, that I uncovered was that of my father. Um, sorry, that's my father and my mother there. That's me and my father. So I'm going to go very quickly. Those are my grandparents in Prague with my father as a little boy. And those are my grandparents. And I'm just going to go. That's a letter from my grandfather, just to give you an idea of how crammed they were with detail. Um, and my, my father's story is really quite extraordinary. So it's March 1943. My father's transport notice arrives. It's a third transport notice. Um, he's been saved from two transports already, but he knows he can't get out of this third one. There's nothing he can do. And he has these letters from his parents saying, you have to do whatever you can do, but do not come here. So the family had a paint factory in Prague. It was managed by a wonderful man called Mr. Novak, who wasn't Jewish. And Mr. Novak devised a system. He was obviously incredibly brave and loyal and kind. And he created a false wall and this created a tiny cubicle behind which my father could hide. So as the 50 employees went in during the day to work, my father would lie very, very, very still until they left at six o'clock. And then when they left at six o'clock, my father could sneak out through a tiny window and go outside. Now the paint factory is still standing in Prague um, today. And I, I know so because I actually visited it with Mr. Novak's daughters, one of whom remembers the fights because she was alive during the war and she was, a, I think, a six-year-old little girl and she remembers the fights between Mr. Novak and Mrs. Novak because obviously harboring a Jew or helping a Jew, if you as much as gave them a cigarette, it was, you were already breaking the law. So hiding one was punishable by death. Um, so anyway, so my father is in hiding in the paint factory and he has a best friend, a best friend who he's been at chemistry school with, who he, I don't think he studied very much, actually. I think as far as I can tell from the letters and, and, and from everyone involved in the story wrote little memoirs as such. And from every tale, my father basically, as far as I can tell, read poems, chased girls and played pranks on people. Um, so Stenek and him were pranksters and that's really what bonded them. Um, and they had also studied chemistry together. Stenek was uh, not Jewish, he was a Gentile. So 
but like many young men across the Reich, was sent to help with the war effort. So he was sent to Berlin. And Stenek had been on a break from Berlin, came over with a bottle of Slivovitz, presumably, to visit my father, and jokingly said to my dad, we're so overworked in Berlin. And it was quite ironic because they were overworked in Berlin because all the Jews that had been working as forced laborers had been sent on to Auschwitz. But Stenek said, it's exhausting. If only you could come and help me. Now, there's a Czech saying that goes something like this. I don't speak Czech, sadly, but it's the darkest shadow is just beneath the candle. So if you're going to hide anywhere, you don't hide in the periphery where the light is going to give you away. No, you go to the center of it all where the light cannot illuminate you, where it is darkest, and there you will not be found. So you have to imagine this, it's 1943, you live in Prague, you're a Jew, you're 22 years old. Your parents, most of their family are in this, these camps. You've absconded from the transport. The Gestapo are looking for you. You've been hiding in this room for two months almost, and it's the obvious place to hide. So you know the Gestapo are gonna come and find you. And as a matter of fact, my father was on the Gestapo wanted list. It's still on the records in Prague today. So you're there, what do you do? You decide that you're going to do the craziest thing you can think of, the only thing that will fool your persecutors. So you choose to travel to Berlin in the middle of the war. You pretend you're someone else and you go there and you're gonna hide or actually not hide at all. You're going to be there in plain sight. And you're going to find a job in this factory that Stenek is working for. You're going to start making lacquers for bomber planes. And then you're going to pass off information about the experiments to the Dutch resistance. And you know success is unlikely, of course, but the alternative is much worse. So I'm now going to read you a little bit of, um, sorry, I missed one of the pictures. This is quite a remarkable picture and then I'll read you. This is the factory where my father was working for, was working in. It's called Varnico and Bomb. It still exists today. This was the entrance to the factory. And this was just before my father arrived and a very kind man who's um, a hist an amateur historian and loves the area sent me this picture. Um, so I'm now going to stop sharing my screen. Great. Um, and I'm going to read you a little bit about um, a little excerpt from the book. It's about my father's um, travel to Berlin. So after my father's death, I found a clipped bundle of papers at the bottom of the box he left for me. It was a retrospective diary of his escape to Berlin written in 1991 and 1992. I now know that my father took the night train to Berlin on May the 3rd, 1943, the Elite 147, that departed Hebrinska station in Prague at 1.44 a.m. and arrived in Berlin nearly eight hours later at 9.23. In the spring of 2018, I traveled alone along the same route. It takes four and a half hours today and there is no longer a night train. Even if there had been, I would not have been brave enough to take it. I bought a ticket for the noon train on a May morning. The tracks trace the same path out of Prague as they did in 1943. To my surprise, as the tra train finally left the suburbs behind and curled along the wooded banks of the Vltava River to the right, I passed through the town of Lipchice. From the large carriage windows, I could clearly see the roof, balcony and casement of my grandparents' country house, where my father had spent countless happy childhood weekends. The train then headed north, weaving along the course of the river and came within a kilometre of Terezin itself before crossing the former Czech border and pushing on to Dresden. Then, finally, it reached Berlin. I followed my father's route 75 years after his journey, almost to the day, 
clutching copies of the papers that he had left me. As I made that pilgrimage, I hoped that the night on which my father traveled was moonless and that in his fear, he did not notice his parents' house unlit as the train rolled onward. That he did not know how very close he was to them in the blackness just south of Terezin. I hoped that he felt me cradling him, holding his hand across the worlds of time and experience that then and now lay between us. This is what my father wrote about that journey. The train did not illuminate the tracks. The carriages were dark. The dim lights of the aisles only allowed you to see the coming shadows, the delineations of figures moving, the shells of bodies slumped. I could hear the sound of the train incessantly rumbling and churning. There were five others in my compartment, their faces hidden, like mine. The darkness is why I chose this train, this hour. It must have been close to dawn, four hours since we had left Prague. Passengers sitting and swaying with the movement of the train, our faces shrouded by our coats that hung from bronze hooks. The others might have slept. I couldn't. I was too afraid. We were close to the German border now. I still could not believe I was here, outside the room at the factory, on this train. I touched the passport in my left pocket, the one with the permit to cross the border that Stenka had sourced. In my other, I had the identity card that Mila had given me. We had used a chemical to carefully erase the names and mix the inks to match the color of the rest of the text. It now read Jan Sebesta, chemist, born in Alt Bunslau on March the 11th, 1921. Only the passport had the name Stenik Tuma. I prayed the identity check would be quick in this compartment, a swift formality. I owed Mila the passport also. She was the one who finally convinced Stenik. Things were awful enough. No one wanted to take unnecessary risks, so to have this passport was a miracle. On arrival, I was to post the passport back to Prague so that Stenik could use it to travel back to Berlin in three days. Helping me meant that they were both risking their lives. Stenik had not wanted to let me down, but he was terrified for his sake and for mine. He was scared that I couldn't pull it off. My main worry was the photo in Stenik's passport. Stenik's face was much thinner and more angular than mine. His eyes, like clever piercing darts, were unlike my large green ones. You have the dreamy eyes of an artist, my mother had always said. The train stopped. I heard voices that I assumed to be the conductor and the border police. I took a thin glass vial covered in brown rubber, rubber from my pocket and placed it at the back of my cheek. I held, I held it between the lower back left molars and the side. I was told it would take only a few seconds, a minute at most. Cyanide poisons your nerves so the brain dies first, then the heart. Would death be easy, or would I feel unspeakable pain? Passports, a German voice said. They were not asking for other papers, just passports, not the papers with the other name. I took a breath. In the darkened carriage, the handheld beam lit up each passport held by every extended hand. Three men had the light flash in their faces. Two remained obscured under their hanging coats. I pretended to be asleep. The guard shook me. I kept, my, I, I kept my face hidden beneath the coat, my eyes half closed. My hand moved the coat a few centimeters to show deference and offered him the passport. He looked at it for a few seconds. I was certain that he must be able to see my heart pounding in my chest. Dankeschön, mein Herr, he muttered as he closed it and handed it back. I waited a few minutes to make sure they were gone. The train heaved forward and I was able to breathe again. I coughed and spat the ampoule into my hand. I placed it carefully back in my pocket. I would need it again. I slept until we pulled into the station in Berlin. It was mid-morning. I placed the passports in an envelope which I addressed to Stenik at the central post office in Prague and sent it through the Reich Post. If I was caught now, there would be no more danger to Stenik. 
the warming sunlight shone in between the buildings as I stepped outside. Suddenly, my briefcase felt very light. It was a beautiful spring day in Berlin in May 1943, the fourth year of the Second World War. Berlin. There I was, now Jan Sebesta, a Czech chemist looking for a job and a room to rent. So, as I told you earlier, this really wasn't meant to be a book. Um, it started its life as a personal journey of discovery. I wanted to solve the mystery of my father. Um, it took me about 10 years of, of proper research once I started to piece it all together. I traced people in Indonesia, in France, in California, in Israel, in the Czech Republic. Um, and it's been quite an extraordinary journey. Um, and I have to let you in on a little secret. <laughs> I always wanted to be a detective and I always wanted to be a writer. Um, and I was always a little bit of a detective. I was sort of your, you know, your friendly geek. All my friends, whenever they want something researched, would call me up. Um, so I was sort of a, a private detective, if that makes any sense. Um, and I, I always was a closet writer. So I wrote for myself. I wrote for therapy. Um, I have lots of degrees in literature and I, I think that scared me in the sense that I, I always knew that my writing was not good enough. It was never going to be as good enough as these people that I studied. And that kept me from writing. But as I immersed myself in the research and as I uncovered these pretty incredible stories, a lot of which were remarkable, but a lot of which were just, just purely beautiful, um, I thought, that I had to, I had to tell these stories. And, um, and I literally did just that, partly because I was so immersed in the research, I just wanted to share it with others. Um, but also because it was a way of keeping this marvelous family that I had discovered um, alive, I started telling their stories. And, um, and that's how it became a book, literally, because I started telling someone at a dinner in New York in 2017, January 2017, one of the stories and um, this man who's actually was 89 at the time, is 92 now, who's really remarkable, said, oh, it has to be a book. And I said, yeah, yeah, my husband says the same thing. And he says, no, it really has to be a book. And then the next morning at about 7 a.m. I had an email from him saying you have to get in touch with this woman and she happens to be one of the best agents in the world and she's in London and she liked the story. I, she liked my writing and then she said it's it's going to be a book. So we put together a 120 page book proposal because I had done quite a lot of research and um, sold it to Scribner pretty quickly. And now all of a sudden I'm in this incredible position where um, it's done really well, particularly in the US. So Barnes and Noble, which is a book chain there, are, have said it's going to be their book of the month for November. Um, my agent has sold French and Spanish rights and um, Czech, obviously, and Finnish and Chinese. Um, and I'm working on a second book. So I'm finally doing what I always wanted to do, which was to be a detective and to be a writer. Um, so if you take two things from the talk today, um, and I do hope you'll take a little more than two things, but if you take only two, you should take these. The first one is you need to take risks. You need to think out of the box. Because if my father hadn't done that, well, <laughs> I, I wouldn't be here. I wouldn't have written a book. Um, and the other thing is you have to tell stories. Tell stories to your children. Definitely tell your stories to your children. Don't wait till you're gone for them to have questions. And, and, and I mean, my children are not particularly interested in my story, but I, I tell them anyways. And I think you should do the same. And I think you should also tell stories because, because words mold our actions. They, they shape us. They shape who we are. We are our stories. And we can use words, I think, to 
perpetrate stere stereotypes, to fragment, to incite hatred. Um, or we can use them to bind us to one another. We can use them to teach us lessons. So that's it. Take risks, think out of the box, number one and two. Use your words to tell those stories. Anyways, I think, I think that's it for my talk. Um, I don't know if anyone has any questions at all. Yeah, thank you, Ariana. That was so, um, so personal and, and, and so emotional. So, um, for me. so thank you um, very much. Um, I think Amanda, I think Amanda, you have a question. Do you want to unmute yourself and, and ask the question? And if it's anyone else that might have um, a question for Ariana, don't be, don't be shy. Please um, type it into the, the chat function and um, we, can, we can review and hopefully Ariana will have time to answer as many questions as possible. Absolutely. So, so Amanda's question is what did, Amanda, do you want to ask it? Well, yeah, I, hey, I also wanted to ask how much did your mother know of your, of your father's past? I mean, was she surprised when you found this passport? And then what did she think as you uncovered more and more and then made the decision to publish? How did she feel about that? So my mother knew, um, I think, you know, I, it's funny. I think we find the people we need in life and my father needed someone that wasn't focused on his past. And, and, and my mother was very much like him and, you know, is, has always been someone who's very interested in the, in the now. Um, as a matter of fact, when I started digging into the past, she said, what are you doing? You have this beautiful family and this beautiful present. Why, why are you looking back? Um, which meant actually that when they were together, my mother knew, I would say, sort of the rough traces of my father's life. So she, ha she did know that my father had survived the war by pretending to be someone else. She didn't know how long he, and, and that he had gone to Berlin. She didn't know how long exactly he had spent in Berlin. She certainly didn't know any of the details. She didn't know, for example, that he was a firefighter in Berlin or the horrible stories of the bombs in Berlin. Um, she knew very little about my grandparents. She knew they um, had died in concentration camps, but didn't again know any of the details. So she was, um, I think at first she was a little surprised that I was, you know, ignoring my, not ignoring, but, you know, instead of focusing on my beautiful um, life now, I was all of a sudden trying to solve these mysteries of the past. Um, and then as I started uncovering the stories, she realized too that um, actually maybe there was a reason and, and, and that actually the past is I mean, I think it's inexorably linked to our present. So we definitely need, you know, if, if you can know where you come from, it, it, it helps you, it helps guide you as to where you're going. Um, and, you know, I think it's, I think it came as a huge surprise. I think it's difficult. My parents actually divorced when I was a teenager. So I think discovering all these things about my father um, just meant that you know, she, she knows him now in a different way that she knew him when she was married to him. And I think, um, I think it's different. I think parents don't always tell their children the full story. So I think we're more forgiving of our parents for not telling us stories than we are of our partners, maybe. Um, so I don't know if that answers the question. Um, but I mean, she's now thrilled and she's, she's I, I think she's, she was always very supportive of the book, even though she was a little baffled. Um, by, by my desire to sort of delve into this darkness, which actually turned out to be just filled with light. Um, but um, I don't know, is that? Yeah, it's, yeah, great. I think we have a question from um, Lee Richards. Mm -hmm. uh, Lee, do you want to unmute yourself and, and ask the question yourself? Um, yeah, just very quickly, uh, the story going forward is partly, you mentioned father became a firefighter which must have been the last days of Berlin I guess must have been awful um, and of, also how did you end up from being a Venezolana to being a UK citizen? Uh, but I've just just recently become a UK citizen so I'm still very much a Venezolana <laughs> and, and I, um, I, I mean I, I, I lived in New York before living here um, and I 
I thought I should come here. I, I eventually, my father, I mean, I, I thought I was going to go back to Venezuela and work in newspapers. Um, my father um, was involved with them and it's the part um, that I was interested in. Um, little, of course, did I know that Venezuela was going to disintegrate into what it is now. Um, and obviously that didn't happen. But I, at the time, came to England because there are more newspapers, I don't know if you know this, but, or at least, uh, and I, don't, I think this is still true, but there are more newspapers per capita here than anywhere else in the world. Um, so I came to find a job in a newspaper. Um, and I, I did, I started working at a place called The European, which was a little bit ahead of its time. It was owned by the Barclay Brothers and it had Andrew Neal as an editor. And I, um, I had a very menial job in the features section and wrote little articles for them. But that's, um, and I, I have to tell you, I came here and I thought there's no sunshine. It's not spontaneous enough. <laughs> I need to get back, if not to Venezuela, at least to New York. Um, but then I fell in love with this barrister from Sheffield. And that was a further complication because, you know, barristers can't practice anywhere except in England. Um, luckily, he agreed that we didn't have to live in Sheffield. Um, so we're in London, which is slightly sunnier. So that's, that's how I ended up in the UK. And I've been here for, I guess, almost 20 years. Do you have a Venezuelan temper just out of interest? You, you might have to ask my husband, who I, I don't know if he's around, but he might unmute himself. Maybe, maybe don't ask him. Yes, I do. I think it's very healthy to voice um, to voice your feelings often and loudly. <laughs> I, you're not Venezuelan. You're not Venezuelan, Lee. No, no, I've known a few Venezuelan ladies. Have you? Oh no, <laughs> poor you. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Sounds um, interesting. Um, uh, Claire Eden, um, I can see you have a question in the chat. Do you want to ask it yourself? Yes, I'm unmuted. Hi, Ariana. Thanks very much for sharing that. Um, I just wanted to know if you tracked living relatives from your father's side and, and whether you've been able to actually meet them and how that had been. Yes, so I, I have tracked. I've tracked, um, I've tracked pretty much everybody. So I'm in touch with everybody. I haven't met them all because um, two of, so there were 34 members of my father's family before the war. 25 died um, during the Holocaust. Um, but two of my father's first cousins um, who survived Auschwitz and Dachau made it um, their point to have as many children as possible. So I have a lot, a lot of cousins um, and uh, all over the world. Um, and I've, um, I'm in touch with the ones in California. Um, I'm in touch with the ones in the Czech Republic. Lots of them don't speak, um, only speak Czech and I don't speak Czech but lots of them speak French. Um, and I've, I've been incredibly fortunate to meet, um, I met a cousin, actually she died last year, but she is absolutely lovely and her father survived Riga. Um, and um, I, I mean, it's been an incredible journey. I've also traced all, all the children of the people that helped my father, so Stenik Tuma, who was my father's best friend, um, has a son called Stenik Tuma. And I haven't yet met him. Um, I was meant to go to Prague for the book launch in Prague in May, but of course the pandemic threw everything up in the air. Um, but I've met Stenik's granddaughter, um, who's just absolutely brilliant. Um, and, and so I now have this huge family, having not, not no, having had no Czech family growing up. I have, I have an enormous amount of, of, of cousins everywhere. And, and I'm certainly in touch with them via Facebook and via email and, um, and and I speak to the ones that the ones that speak English or speak French. Um, Did any of them have any clue of what had happened to your father? Um, n n yes and no. So they had heard little snippets. Um, they didn't, I mean, obviously my father's brother knew all the details. Um, I had an, an aunt in California who obviously knew the whole story, but she never told, she never told she never spoke about it with me. And actually she knew my cousins in California who she never told me I had. So there was, there was obviously some sort of fracture in the, in the family at some stage. Um, but my cousins in California, for example, not only had no idea about what happened to my father, but they had no idea they were 
Jewish at all. So no, they had no, no, no kid at Tufts come up to them and say, you guys, you know, you're, you're Jewish. <laughs> so, um, so it was a bit of a surprise. One of them actually was a Methodist, uh, a practicing Methodist. And he was, um, he spends his weekends building houses for um, people across the border in Mexico. And he, I think he was rather shocked to find out that he had this heritage. And there was another one actually who was remarkable because um, he kept all these letters. His father had been a philatelist and his father was a cousin, a first cousin of my father's. And, um, and when his father had died in California, so this was um, a brother of my grandfather. My grandfather had seven siblings and one of them had moved to California in 1919. So this is that branch. And again, they didn't know they were Jewish. Um, and he had all these letters and he had gone after um, communism fell. So he had gone, I think in 1995 to these addresses that he had to ask if there was family there. And of course there was no family there, but he hadn't realized that they had di all died in, in the Holocaust. Um, but he was absolutely, I mean, he was just lovely because upon hearing the story and what I was doing, he said, well, I'll send you all the letters because he said, I have all these letters with stamps, you know, I kept them because of the stamps. Um, but there's all these envelopes. And I said, and do the envelopes have letters? And he said, yes, yes, all the envelopes have letters. So that was remarkable because all of a sudden I had all the letters that my grandfather was writing to his brother in America throughout the thirties, every single one. And the only reason this cousin of mine called um, Victor had kept them was because he, um, his father was a philatelist and he just thought he should keep his father's things, even though his father had moved on. So thank there were you. lots, anyway, thank you. Um, we have, well, actually we have, uh, going back to the previous question, um, Andrew, Roger, Ariana's um, husband has, has kind of just said that she is extremely serene. So that's, <laughs> yeah, exactly. so. <laughs> yeah, <December. laughs> So now we now now we know. <laughs> um, Terry, do you want to unmute yourself and ask and ask your question? Terry, are you? Yep, I'm here. Um, Hi, I absolutely love this book. It was really really um, enjoyable. It flowed so well, um, and uh, as I said, I, I I just couldn't put it down. And um, um, but the one one question I have about the book is what it must have been like for your father getting out of Berlin in um, April or whatever, May, 1945. Um, but also I'd like to know about the movie when it's coming. Oh, you're very sweet. Well, um, I mean, I think my father wrote a little bit about what it, must, what it was like to get out of Berlin in April, 1945. And I think everyone was just desperately trying to get out. And he, he uh, I think he sort of basically threatened an official in order to get a permit and said, listen, I'm going to remember you. And if you're nice to me, as you know, obviously it was obvious <laughs> that the end of the war, you know, the end of the war was coming. And he said, if you're nice to me, I will put in a good word, but I will also remember you if you're not nice to me and I will come and get you. Um, <laughs> and he got, he got a permit out and he then made it to Prague and he basically wasted no time in getting married to this marvelous woman called Mila, who was his, um, girlfriend in Prague and who had helped him with the ID card um, and the movie well I'm incredibly lucky that I have um, uh, I have a producer who is wonderful who is um, interested in making a film we haven't signed anything yet because of the pandemic and, and because lawyers are, are bores um, so I but I, I, I hope it will come soon and there's a documentary in the works as well so um, thank you Thank you. Thank you. Um, we have a question from Anna. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've unmuted. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yeah. Oh, great. Ariana, thank you so much for sharing your brave story. Okay. Um, I have to say that I haven't read the book, but um, I would like to ask some questions about how you managed with the fictionalization of certain events, dialogue, etc. Um, and how you constructed the, the plot. So I, um, 
let me start with the dialogue first, which is the easy one. I, there isn't very much dialogue in the book. So the book moves from my, my voice as I uncover the story to my voice as I na narrate the story as I have uncovered it to my father's uh, writings. So the dialogue, there's very little dialogue. There are some, a couple of scenes which are recreated and they're recreated from anecdotes. So I'm, uh, I'm not really a historian, but I did history at university. So I, and, and this is again, not a history book, but a personal memoir. And, and it was constructed from documents, but also from narratives, um, which are of course other pe people's memoirs. So I'm completely aware that they're tainted by feelings and time. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, I, if there is a dialogue, it was directly lifted. So there's a, a bit of dialogue that I remember a couple of sentences of this woman called Stenka, who's this, I wish I had more time to speak about her because she's brilliant and she sneaks into the concentration camp of Theresienstadt and she is beautiful inside and out and bold and wonderful. But she she wrote memoirs as well. And I'm in touch with her daughter who lives in Switzerland and um, they're literally lifted. So the dialogue, there's a dialogue there that's lifted from, um, from her memoirs. And I tended to, um, again, if there, there there's a little bit, I think, in chapter two or three, when um, my grandfather is talking to Lotta. And again, that's from family anecdotes that I heard from two of my cousins um, who, who were, who, whose father did speak about the war to them a little bit. So there isn't a lot of dialogue. I hope, I hope that's not going to put you off. Oh, from no, no. Can, I, can I just squeeze another little question in there? Yeah. That, um, how aware were you of your father being with you as you were writing during that process? Oh, he was constantly with me. And, um, you know, it's interesting because I, as I went back, the father I knew was very tough and he was very methodical and he was a workaholic. And what I discovered, and I initially, when I started reading these letters, I thought maybe I had it wrong. So the Czechs, they changed people's names. So my father was Hans, but there was this Handa and Hando. And I kept on thinking, maybe there's another cousin because there were so many names and so many things. And, and anyways, I, I then realized that this boy um, in the letters was my father. And I, the reason I hadn't rec recognized him is because he was a prankster and he was a complete shambles. He was always late. Um, he just was completely disorganized. He wrote poetry, bad poetry, um, just chased girls and just, you know, was not at all this and, and was always late. And the father I met was just so punctual. So <laughs> it was sort of marvelous because not only did I have the father, my father as I knew him, but I had my father as he really was. Uh, and I had that young boy with me throughout and I, I still have him now. So I'm, I feel closer to him now than I did, if mm. that's possible when Yes, I can, I can understand that. Thank you so much, Ariana. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Daniela, um, would you like to ask your, your question? Hi, yes. After that initial phone call from college, did your father ever talk about any aspects of his past or did you ever raise it again? Because it's quite a big thing. I suppose to find out you're Jewish when you're 18 or 17. Yes, so I did, I did raise it again. And, um, you know, I think when you're the child of someone who's a trauma survivor, um, even though you want to know things, if you ask questions and it upsets them, you learn to sort of not ask questions, you learn to calibrate them very carefully. And if, you know, if he would start to shake, then I would, um, I would stop asking questions. So any answers that I got were very fragmented. Um, there were there were a little bit. So he did speak to me very, you know, very few times in his life where he spoke for more than five minutes, if that makes any sense, because he would start talking and then he'd get upset and then he'd leave. Um, so there were little things that he would say. So he did say to me, I went... Uh, I mean, I, I, I knew that his name in Berlin was Jan Sebasta. As a matter of fact, our eldest son is called Sebastian, um, just as a, in honor of the, of the name that saved my father's life. Um, so I, I, there were little bits that he did share, but I mean, it was probably not, I mean, 90% of the story he, he shared through the documents um, and through his writings rather than by uh, telling me directly. 
and and it was a pretty huge thing to discover that um, that you're Jewish at, at at well at any age, but 17 seemed a bit late um, to to do so. Um, but anyways, um, thank you. I think um, I think we have one one last question, Joy. I think um, do you want to unmute yourself and and ask your your question? Ah, there we go. Um, yes, I just was curious. Thank you very much. Anyway, it was an amazing um, story and I'll definitely read the book. Um, just very curious how you ended up in Venezuela or how your family ended up in Venezuela. So my father, um, after the war, um, he went back to Prague. Um, they, they restarted the paint factory that the family had and, um, and I think it all became too much um, and, and the communists arriving didn't help. Um, and he decided with uh, that he had a he had two uncles that lived in America. He had tried to move to America before the war, but there were quotas, um, not specifically against Jews, but certainly against people from um, Central Europe um, who had obviously been fleeing the Nazis. So um, he couldn't go there. So they looked at other options. I think they looked at Cuba. They looked at um, other countries in South America. I think they were quite sure they didn't want to go to Palestine um, or Israel and they um, or Australia, but they, they did sort of look at all these things. And one of my father's uncles who had left in 1938, who succeeded in, in, in leaving in 1938, um, went and did some reconnaissance and they the family business was paints so they figured they would start they would go wherever they went and and start a paint factory and venezuela was just coming out of a of a military dict dictatorship it was opening up um it was open to refugees so as long as you were baptized you could come in um and that um was quite unusual so i mean there was no other requirement you could just migrate you just had to show a, a certificate um, and and they didn't it, it was one of the few countries in Latin America there was a there's a big paint factory I think they're American but they have factories all over um, if they had one in Argentina for sure it's called Sherwin Williams and my father didn't want to compete with that so they went to Venezuela um, because there was no no paint production made in the country. So they went in and started a paint factory, which they called Montana, which was the same name as the paint fa family paint factory in Prague. And there's a wonderful letter from 1948 saying, actually, you know, if you, if you don't mind the lack of culture and the mosquitoes, um, it's really a pretty nice place to live. Um, so that's where they went. Wow. Thank you. Thank you. I think, um, I mean, I think we could carry on for, for, for a lot longer, but I think, um, I think we might, um, we might end it, end it there. But um, thank you so much, Ariana, for giving us such an insight to your family's past um, and to the process of writing and then um, publishing a book. Um, it was really, really um, a great talk. And thank you, uh, audience, for such great questions. If you would like to join us for more of these virtually speaking events, please have a look at the Foundation uh, website. Next week, we have two talks. On Tuesday night, we have alumni Richard Phelps, class of 1983. Richard was an Olympic rower then made it to the final at the 1992 Olympics. And he will reflect on some of the lessons that he learned during um, his rowing career um, that are applicable to the real world of leadership, whether you're a club captain or a CEO. Um, and on Wednesday night, uh, Wallace Collection Director Dr. Xavier Bray will explore how the Wallace, one of the most um, and viable private collections in the 19th century came into public ownership in, 19, oh, in 1897, sorry, and how such a precious and distinguished collection remain relevant today. 
so both really interesting so make sure not to not to miss that um, sadly that brings us to the end of this evening's talk so thank you so much for joining us thank you again ariana for your very personal um, and moving story um, and i hope to see you all very soon thank you